welcome to In the Beginning. We are in the fourth week. Can you believe it? This is actually our sixth week anniversary as a church. Super exciting. If you haven't been with us before, if you're first time with us, we are so excited that you chose today to be here. We're believing that God's going to speak today and we're going to listen, not just hear. We are in part two. You'll have to go back last week if you weren't with us. We're in part two of how to not hear from, but how to listen to God. Last week we talked about the difference between hearing and listening. And so, okay, I need to say something and I'm hoping that someone listens, but not just listens, but responds, okay? Now, crazy stuff has happened this morning. Now, it's our job as a church to deflect that from you so you don't feel it. But here's a couple things that have happened this morning. Our men's bathroom has almost flooded. <laughs> um, the, the urinal got stuck down and there's water everywhere. So we've mopped it up. But uh, if you go in there, just have grace on us. We're working through that. Secondly, now, if you've been here for a while, you've maybe heard us talk about we're doing a big pumpkin patch and we're having thousands of pumpkins delivered. Now, we were supposed to do that yesterday at 2 p.m., but they called us and said, hey, the semi, they can't make it out because the hurricane, you know, we'll give you two days notice. Well, they called at 10 o'clock and said we'll be there in nine minutes today <laughs> like today <laughs> and so um <laughs> so this just happened so here's i'm gonna ask and i totally get it i'm not dressed for it in any form or fashion um but after service today if anyone is able and willing to help us for a little bit um this was going to be like a 40 person couple hour job on saturday um and now we're kind of stuck with they need to get them off their semi and go so even if we can just get them off it would be such a huge blessing i'm sorry to put that on you but uh this just happened or it's just going to be me by myself unloading a thousand pumpkins and then i won't walk for a week and I'll have to complain a lot. So uh, this morning, last thing, on your way out, bridge groups, they start next week. This next week, they're starting. Grab a flyer on your way out. Go online. Find out what group you may be able to connect into. We believe life is better in circles, not rows. So when we get in circles together as groups, we believe that's where God shows up. So anyways, I'm done with announcements. Who is ready to hear a word from God? Somebody. I'm excited. Okay. So last week, if you weren't here, we talked about Samuel, the 12-year-old boy who would later be a prophet, okay? So God interrupts him in the middle of the night and says, Samuel, Samuel. He starts calling out to Samuel, right? And so if you were here last week, you remember that, but this was a blatant interruption to Samuel's life. Samuel wasn't waiting on God to show up. God just showed up. And sometimes God will do that. When we're not expecting it, when we haven't prepared for it, when we're not planning for God to show up, he'll interrupt and start speaking our name and then ask us to do something. He had a prophetic word uh, for the king, for the, for the prophet. And so um, this morning, I'm going to take a different approach to how to listen to God. Last week was when God boldly and blatantly shows up. This morning's going to be a little different. I'm going to talk it through the life of Elijah, through a portion of his life. Um, but before I do that, I want to set that up. I'm going to speak about a different way that you could hear from God and God may speak. But I just want to give you, just for practicality, um, last week we talked about the difference between hearing and listening. So I want to use this word listen a whole bunch today. So I just want to be clear on what the difference is. So hearing is simply the act of perceiving sound by the ear. If you are not hearing impaired, hearing simply happens. Listening, however, is something you consciously choose to do. Listening requires concentration so that your brain processes meaning from words and sentences. So there is a difference, right? You hear all kinds of things, but you listen to very few things. You choose what you listen to. Some people today, I'm listening for the score of the Vikings game today because I'm interested in it. Now, I know there's some Cardinals fans in there, diehard Viking fan. I'm listening for a Vikings W today. Now, I'll hear some of the other scores. I don't really care that much. I deeply care, and I'm concentrating on the score to that game. It's a difference between hearing and listening, and I believe there are six this is practical okay so if you brought a notebook i believe in note taking it's a great practice to have because you can take it with you now these are six practical ways that god speaks number one god speaks through his word through the bible this is the inspired divine spoken word of god over your life let me just say this if you're waiting on an audible voice of god you may wait your whole life and not hear it but i promise you this if you made a seven day commitment i'm going to crack my bible every day and i don't really know what i'm supposed to read and i don't know where i'm going to turn to maybe just start in the book of john or somewhere but i'm going to open it up and god i'm going to give you 15 minutes and I'm going to read your word. I, I promise you 
God's word will come alive and he will speak to you. I can promise you that. Now, it's not because I know that. It's because God promised it. He speaks through his word. In 2 Timothy, it says, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. At any moment, God's word could come alive in your life. At any moment. You don't know what you're reading, right? We're reading some Old Testament stuff. Most people, a lot of people, they just read the New Testament because Old Testament can be very confusing and that version of God is not that palatable to some people. But what I'll tell you is today we're going to be in the Old Testament again. And I promise you God's going to speak not through me, but through his word. So that is the first way that God speaks. Number two, through prayer. You know what prayer is? First conversation. Any married people in the room? Raise your hand. Any happily married people? I'm just kidding. Don't put your name down. <laughs> Keep it up. Now, if you're not married, you dated probably at some point. And if you haven't, you will. So here's what I want to say is you didn't get married on your first date. You had a conversation and the first one was probably a little scary and a little timid. You were maybe a little shy about how to talk to that person that caught your eye. In the same way, God can be very much the same. Maybe some people in this room, you're intimidated by God or you think that God can't possibly hear you. Here's what I wanna say. It doesn't start with you being a fully devoted follower of Christ. It starts with a conversation. It starts with a moment where you say, God, I don't know a lot about you and I don't understand your ways, but God, would you start to reveal yourself to me? And when you start to pray, which is conversate with God, he starts to speak. Now, again, not always audibly. When I say audibly, it's not like a Jeremiah. It's not a voice of God. It could be in your spirit. It could be in your soul. And so God speaks through prayer. How about nature? Anyone else, like, that's the place where God speaks to you? I'm telling you, for me, if I get out hiking or if I go on a guy's trip or a backpacking thing, it is one of the quickest ways for me to hear from God. So here's what I give you permission to do. If I seem like I'm stale, don't say that yet. You'll devastate me. But if I seem like, dude, you need to get a fresh anointing from the Lord, someone needs to come and just tell me you need to go and just spend some time in nature. Because that is so quick. God speaks to me so clearly in nature. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Just by being in nature for many people, God will speak to you. People. God uses people all the time. Doesn't have to be your pastor, but it can be. It could be your spouse. It could be your friend. It could be your neighbor. It could be a stranger. It could be a teacher. God will not stop at anything to speak to you. He'll use unbelievers to speak to you. He can use any avenue he wants. And people is one of the greatest ways that he'll speak. But it's not always a blessing. Sometimes it's a warning. Sometimes it's a hard truth that you don't want to hear. And sometimes God's in the midst of that through people. And so that's another way. Two more. Through worship. You know why we start every service by worshiping? Because we want to set the stage for God to move. And, and, and worship is not about us. Now that's the thing. If you're like, I don't feel that song. You missed the point. It wasn't about the song. It wasn't about the beat. It wasn't about the tempo. It wasn't about the preference. It was about we're giving God all the glory so that we've set up a platform and a stage for God to move. When we give God praise, it, it prepares our heart for him to move. And so through worship, we know that our spiritual eyes are open for God to speak. Last one. God often speaks through circumstance. Now, there's good and bad to this, right? So when you get married, it, it, it models Jesus and the church, right? And so through the circumstance of marriage, we can see Jesus and the church, that relationship, that beautiful love covenant that we see in Scripture. We see that through earthly circumstance. But sometimes in sickness and in accident, there's a death, there's a horrible disease, there's an accident, there's a famine, there's a whatever it is. And sometimes we think that's the absence of God. But I'll tell you this, the most defining moment of my life was after a horrific car accident when I realized I think God has more for me than this. And so God will use an accident, God will use an uncomfortable situation. He'll use a circumstance to get our attention. Watch this. Now, here's what some people confuse circumstance for, right? You're waiting on a new car. I'm using this as an example because this was me yesterday. I literally, I'm not, I'm not kidding. This was yesterday. Now, I've been waiting on a specific color car, a specific model, a specific year in a specific price range. And so many times, watch this, we'll have these things for God. And maybe it's a work, maybe, maybe it's a neighborhood you want to live in. I don't know what it is for you, but for me, it's been a car recently. And I had all of these, these specific things lined up. And if this all comes together, guess what? 
God must be in it. It has to be God. I, how could this dealer have the exact car I wanted? In the color, in the price range, I went and I left without getting the car. Because guess what? Now, would God have been okay? With, I could have got the car. It wasn't a super spiritual moment. But sometimes we let circumstance confuse us. Just because it all seems as if God's in it, we'll take that as, oh, God's definitely in it. Look at this. It's all leading towards this. Let me tell you. God will speak through circumstance, and just because it all lines up does not mean God's in it. And so it's very confusing. We can get in this place of always thinking if it lines up, it's God. And so this morning, those are six of the most popular, prevalent ways that God will speak. There's others as well, but this morning, just for us, as we're practically trying to apply this. So this morning, we're going to talk about Elijah. Now, we're going to get into the text in a moment, but again, like any good story, you have to know a little bit of the beforehand before we can get into the text. And so we find Elijah, he is a major prophet of the Old Testament. Uh, he is a big deal in the Bible as you get into the Old Testament or even into the New Testament. Elijah and Moses are big time prophets. So last week, Samuel, we talked about him being the first prophet. Elijah is down the line now. And now he has a fully established ministry. He's doing great things for God. He is showing up. He's speaking truths. He's warning people. He's had success at this moment. Now here's where we're at in the story. Elijah... It doesn't say that God told him to do this, but Elijah saw a lack and a void in the people of Israel. They were turning from God and they were turning to false gods. And so where he was, there was uh, this one God named Baal. And, and so the, the Bible says that there were 450 prophets of this one God, Baal. And then there were 450 prophets or 400 prophets of another God. Okay, so 850 prophets of a false God. And then you have Elijah, who is one prophet of one God, okay? So maybe you know this story. Now, I'm not going to tell this whole story because this is leading to where I want to get to. But there's this showdown. Elijah says, guess what? Your God's fake. He's a hoax. He's not real. And of course, that upsets pretty much the whole nation because they believe in this false God. And so Elijah says, all right, let's do this. We're going to settle this over an arm wrestling match. No, I'm just kidding. He doesn't do that. He says, let's settle this over whose God shows up first by making fire. He, he challenged them to a fire making uh, competition. Now they're in a drought, which was a huge drought. It was a, a drought that had killed many people. Livestock was, was, was famished. And so he says, whoever's God shows up first in fire, that's the real God. Now Elijah sets up this altar, right? With wood and stones. And he sets up this whole thing. They sacrifice an animal. They put it there. And basically Elijah is verse 850 prophets of a false god, okay? And he says, you know what? I'm gonna give you first crack at it. You see if your God will show up. Their God was actually the God of fire. That's actually, so, so I think there's some like, there's some sarcasm there when, when Elijah's like, let's see whose God can show up in fire because that was the fire God. And so he lets them have it. He says, you get first crack at it. And so they start to pray and it says they did this for about four hours. They're praying. Their God's not doing anything. They're chanting. Elijah starts to get sarcastic and say, hey, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe your God's busy. Maybe your God can't hear you. Yell louder. And so I'm just picturing 850 people, sold out prophets to a false God, chanting, running around. It actually says they started to mutilate themselves. They started to cut themselves and trying to sacrifice themselves so that their God would listen. Nothing happens. And finally, Elijah's like, you done? <laughs> are you done? <laughs> and because nothing's happening. And he's kind of sitting off probably with a smirk the whole time, just like, this is ridiculous. I cannot believe that they're doing this. And so finally, Elijah says, all right, let me do this. It's my turn. And later I'm going to do an illustration at some point over this. But he has this altar set up, right? That's set up for fire. Now, what Elijah does next is unbelievable because you know that water and and wood don't really create fire usually. They actually go against each other. So it says that he took big buckets of water and dumped them all over the altar. Okay? Now he's, he's trying to make a point at this point, right? He's going over and beyond. Some would say he's being a little extra. <laughs> Is that what the young folk are saying these days? <laughs> and so he pours water all over the altar, which again would make it very difficult for fire to happen. But he says, guess what? My God's going to show up in fire. So he calls on God and, and the Lord shows up and a rain of fire from heaven ignites the whole altar. Boom. Everyone sees the power of God. Okay. So I tell all this to say, 
This was a monumental moment in the life of Elijah. He had just seen the Lord show up. He, he put God in a platform to move, and guess what? God showed up and did something unbelievable. But what happens next is where many of us will find ourselves in a deep struggle because what happens next to Elijah is unpredictable. He has this high moment with God, this moment where God shows up in such a profound way, and then the queen says, you know what? We gotta get him out of here. She puts a death warrant on his life. She tells everyone in town, the first one to kill him, you know, you get dinner in my house. She makes a big deal about whoever can kill Elijah, now you've just earned something special. And so the whole region is now looking for Elijah. He takes off, okay? So he has this big moment with God. He shows up in fire, he burns up the altar. 850 prophets, they see the power of God. And then Elijah literally is running for his life. Now, it wasn't just for one day or two days or three days. The Bible says that for 40 days and nights, he ran into the wilderness. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know if you ever had like a mountaintop experience with God. I know I have. A moment where, man, God felt so close to me. He felt so near to me. I heard his voice. I saw him move. And then it seems as if many times I go into this dormant season where I can't feel God, I can't hear him, I don't know where he is, I'm reaching out, I'm doing all the same things, and I can't seem to communicate with God. I don't know if there's anyone in here that says, I've been there before. But now Elijah, he's seen this great movement of God, and now he's running into the wilderness for his life. He's wondering, where is God? It actually says that he laid under a tree, and he asked God to kill him one of the greatest prophets in the history of the world. He had seen God do something that no man had ever seen God do. He's one of two people to not experience an earthly death. We find this out later on. God loved Elijah so much, but for 40 days, some of us, we can't wait 40 minutes on God. 40 days, he's running. Now, he's not just, God would just show up. He's literally, he's running from enemies that want to kill him, and he can't seem to communicate with God. And so he lays under a tree and says, God, would you just kill me? I'd rather die. Now that's a pretty deep place of sorrow. And I don't know if anyone's quite there today, but I do know that many people in this room, you feel like God is distant from you. You feel like you don't hear God's voice. You may be an unbeliever in this room and you don't even know that God truly speaks to people. Here's what I would say. Last week, God boldly interrupted Samuel's life, but the way that Elijah's about to hear from God is very different. And I think that this applies to your life today. And this is something we can learn. So that's all the setup for where Elijah's at. He just got up from laying under a tree asking God to kill him. And we pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 9. It says, And the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? I probably have a sarcastic response. What am I doing here? What are you doing? <laughs> I'm out here because I'm running for my life because I stepped up and had bold faith and asked you to send fire so that, so that they would know that you're God. What do you mean, what am I doing here, God? I mean, if we're just being real in the church today, I think I'd be a little upset at the question. <laughs> like, what are you asking? What am I doing here? It's a simple but powerful question. Let me ask you today in your life, what are you doing? What are you doing? Now, depending on the tone that you think God would say it to towards you, it depends on how you answer the question. Because like, what are you doing? That's a kind of an exciting, I want to respond to that, but like, what are you doing? It changes depending on the tone. But let's just say God is like, what are you doing? I think this was a father type son type question. Like, you know, your son's doing something that's kind of crazy. And you're just like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, it comes from a place of care, but you're also quite concerned and you see things wrong. I don't know where God's tone was in this, but he asks them the simple question, what are you doing here, Elijah? You see, God knows the answer. He's not surprised why Elijah's there, but I think he wants Elijah to process it. So today, let me just say this. Sometimes God will ask a question in your soul. What are you doing? I'm going to ask you the question today in your job. What are you doing in your family? What are you doing in your life that lives and represents Christ? What are you doing now? Again, depending on how you receive the tone of that question, your response may change, but that's a question. That's a real question that God would ask us today. What are you doing? Verse 10, Elijah replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, 
and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. I don't know. I can't say that there was. But when I read this, I read sarcasm. I read it like, what am I doing? I'm the only one left, God. I don't know if you noticed this, but everyone else either rejected you or is dead. And so I think Elijah's a little bit upset at the question. And Elijah starts to make a case for how good he's been. God, I don't know if you know this, but no one else is left. I don't know if you know this, God, but I was the one back at Mount Carmel who showed up and, and, and put everyone to the test. I don't know if you know this, God. He starts to make a case for himself. And so I wonder how God's going to respond. Because we know that, that God is no rewarder of person. We know that God is not impressed by our best deeds. They don't impress God. And so Elijah is almost trying to say, God, look how good I've been. Therefore, spare my life. I don't know what he's asking for God, but he, he puts out a representation of what he's done. Verse 11, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Thank you, God. I, I, for 40 days and 40 nights, I haven't heard you. For 40 days and 40 nights, I've been struggling. I've been running. I've been racing just to keep myself alive. And so uh, God just said, okay, okay, okay. He's not mad at me. He's going to show up. He tells me to wait at the edge of the mountain because he's going to pass by. See, God doesn't seem like he's angry with Elijah for all of his doubt, all of his misunderstanding, all of his questions, the fact that just before this, he was begging God to kill him under a tree. You don't see God rebuking him there and saying, I cannot believe your faith. We see him carefully and lovingly show up and say, Elijah, get out of the cave. Pick yourself up. Get out of your sorrow. Go stand at the edge of the cage. I'm going to show up. Verse 11. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. You got to picture this stuff. Because I, I, if I had a movie to show you, I'd show it to you. You're on the edge of a, of a cliff. And you're overlooking a valley. And you're waiting for God to show up. And literally a tornado comes through the valley. And you're standing in a very unstable place. And rocks are flying. And I don't know about this, but I'm from the Midwest. Any other Midwesters? Okay. Now, th there's something called Tornado Alley, which I lived in. Now, during the summer, I'm not kidding. There are few things in the entire world that freak me out, like a nighttime tornado. It's so freaky just because you hear it and you see like glimpses in the lightning. And I just imagine Elijah standing at the edge of a cage, a cave. He's waiting for God to show up. And then a tornado happens. And it says it starts to rip apart the very foundations of the mountain. But then very interestingly, it says... The Lord was not in the wind. Now that's crazy because many times, like, I believe there's some people in this room. You want God to speak to you. You want God to move in your life. Now you may not say it audibly, but you want it. You know in your heart that God has more for you than the life you're living today. And you say, God, I need you and I want you. And you're sitting there. And as soon as the tornado would happen, I, I'm just being honest. I would think, oh, this is God. God's definitely here. God's showing up. He's ripping things apart. What does this mean? Is this a figurative example? He's going to tear my life apart and build me back. Like, I would start to think that the tornado was definitely God. When God shows up in a powerful way, that's what most of us assume is the only way God will show up. But it says that God was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. He's waiting on God. God sends a tornado, but says he's not in it. But what if Elijah said, you know what? I'm freaked out. I'm at the edge of a, at the edge of a mountain. Like, I, I, I don't have to stay here for this. There's a tornado and now an earthquake. Like, God, I'm out. But he stands there. Can you imagine? Anyone been through an earthquake? Anyone in this room? I haven't. But I can imagine the, the, the place that he was would be a very unstable place to be during an earthquake. So an earthquake happens, but it says he's not in the earthquake. I would wonder, what are you trying to tell me right now, God? What's the message? I'm quite confused at the moment. You said you were going to show up. I've seen a tornado and now an earthquake, but you're not in either of those. But in the moment, I don't know that Elijah knew that. He's just a spectator to what's happening. He sees a tornado. He sees and feels an earthquake, but we find out later God's not in it. Verse 12. 
After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. What? You know what fires do? They destroy everything. Fires leave nothing. And so he, he's, he's now witnessed three major disasters, deadly disasters, and he's standing there and he's still waiting on God. One of people's greatest fears in life is burning to death. I don't know about you, but you see a raging fire coming towards you. I wonder if you would flee. I wonder if you would run away. I wonder if you would take off. But remember, remember what God said. Go to the edge of the mountain for the Lord is about to pass by. Now God told him, I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to show up. But what we see is Elijah is now a spectator to three major distractions. I'm going to speak on that for a moment. Next verse says, after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. See, God wasn't in the wind. God wasn't in the earthquake. God wasn't in the fire. And I think what God was doing there is he was showing Elijah how to block out the distractions and the counterfeits and how to wait on him. Many times in our life we're waiting on God. We say it, we know it in our heart. God, would you speak to me? God, I need you. I need to hear your voice. I need a word for my life. I need a new anointing. I need you, God. But the moment a distraction comes, we're off. And we close our ears and we become hearers, not listeners. So I think Elijah is purposefully being, being put through three major distractions so that God can show him what his voice sounds like and that it's not always in the big interruption, the big massive change to your life. Many times God will show up in the stillness and the quietness of his voice and in your soul. And I think Elijah learned more by seeing what God wasn't in than sometimes what we think God is in. You see, if we're not careful, we'll miss God's voice because we make it about feeling and emotion and experience. And God, if you don't show up and it's not crazy and it doesn't leave me on the floor and, I, and I'm not weeping, then God, you didn't really show up. You didn't move. Many times it's in the stillness and the quietness of our life where God chooses to speak the loudest. But maybe you get confused or you get distracted very easily because the emotion isn't there. The question for us today is, do you know how to listen to God's voice with all the chaos around you? Your kids are fighting for your attention and God bless them for it. Your job is fighting for your, for your ears. This world is fighting for your opinion. With all the chaos around you and all the things that are constantly coming into your, your area, your ears, your eyes, are you able to hear God and sense him in the midst of all that chaos? When it's not about the wind, when it's not about the fire, when it's not about the earthquake. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> Wait, hold on. I thought we already went over this, God. It's interesting that he's not in the wind, he's not in the fire, he's not in the earthquake, and then he comes back around, and the first question he says is, what are you doing here, Elijah? The question didn't change. And so for you, this is a, this is a substantial question for our lives. What are you doing? God will sometimes ask the same question over and over. How's your soul? Who do you say I am? Do you love me with all your heart, your soul? God will ask us the same questions over and over and over. Do you trust me? God would ask you today. Yeah, you say you do, but you don't live like it. God will sometimes ask the same questions because they're fundamental to our belief. What are you doing? Fill in your name. What are you doing? Verse 14. He replied, I think his tone changes when he says it this time. At first, I think he said it with anger, some animosity. I've been very zealous for you, God. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars and they put your prophets to death, God. I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. 
That's how I read the first response. The second time, after he's just witnessed God show up in a still small voice, I think Elijah replies a little more like, God, I love you so much. And I've been very zealous for you, God. I've devoted and dedicated myself to you. The Israelites, they've all rejected you, God. They've rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars and they put your prophets to death by the sword, God. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. I think now he's in a place of God. I don't have any other option. And I don't want you to kill me, but God, I need you to show up. And so the Lord, in verse 15, the Lord says to him, he gets what God wanted him to hear. Go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. He was telling him certain people to anoint. And anoint Elisha to succeed you as prophet. God told him to go back to the place that he had just run from. You know that was the place where everyone wanted to kill him just 40 days earlier? This was the place he saw a triumphant move of God and now God was asking him to go back to the very place that he had run from? God, what are you doing? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Why would you do this? We don't see Elijah fight with God over this. We see Elijah trust God because he just saw him show up and he heard a firm word from God. And I'll just tell you this, sometimes the word, I said this last week, you can't control the word God gives you, you can control what you do with it. This was not a, a, an inspiring word in a sense because God is saying, I need you to go back and you're gonna actually find your successor. The person that's going to succeed you as a prophet, you're gonna go back and anoint them. And you're also gonna go back to the place where everyone wants to kill you. In a moment, God flips everything on him. But here's what I'll say to you today. Will you trust that God is able? Will you trust that God knows what he's doing? Will you trust that God's thought it through? So this may be a life change for some people in this room. You may hear something from God that makes no sense to you. You may listen to God as he tells you to do something that's completely uncomfortable, it's very sacrificial, and it doesn't make any human sense. But what I would tell you today is if you would trust God, I promise you, he has had it in mind forever. He has thought it through. There's blessing on the other side of it. Verse 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha. He went. Probably didn't love what God said. It caused a lot of change and it caused a lot of fear that he had to go back and do. But it says that he went. Go and do what you've heard today. He's got to go do it. So today I'm going to pray over the church this morning. We're going to finish with a, a short chorus. But here's what I'm believing for you. Just like in any relationship, it's got to be two ways. You cannot expect God to show up and move in your life if you're not going to do anything different than what you've done that's led to you not hearing from God. So many people, like, we want to stay in our pattern. We want to stay in our complete rituals and our habits. And what I would tell you today is that God wants to do something brand new in your life, but you got to do something brand new too. You have to change something if you want to hear from God differently. And so today I want to pray over the church, and I'm believing that one of the six ways you're going to get into nature, you're going to get into God's word, you're going to worship privately, you're going to listen to someone around you. I believe that we're going to do something different so that we can hear something new from God. Can I pray for you this morning? Jesus, I just pray for the church. I pray for each person in here. I don't pretend to know the details of their life. I don't know the successes and I don't know the struggles. But God, I do know that you are desperate to speak to us. God, you, you have a word for us. And it's not just a word for today, it's a word for the next week and the next month and the next year, God. You have things that you want to say to us, but God, will we just stop and listen? Father, I pray for the people in this room that are so spiritually distracted 
They're distracted by a relationship. They're distracted by a job, by a career. God, you're trying so badly to get their attention, but they're focused on all the exterior. They're not waiting on your voice. They're waiting on an experience or an emotion or a feeling. And as soon as it comes, they stop listening. Father, I pray for that person today. I pray that they would have ears to listen to you, to hear you in a new way. Father, as we close our time here together, I just pray as we sing about a reckless love, I pray, Father, that the person in this room today that says, I, I don't know God's reckless love, I don't know him as Savior, I've not committed my life to follow after him, I would just invite you, if you're here today and you want to pray for Jesus to become your Lord and Savior, if you want to receive him as the Lord of your life, I believe he's calling you. Will you listen to him today? If you need prayer, we're also here to pray for you. Would you stand as we close this morning in a song of worship?